Hello, you guys. Always good to see you. Good to be seen. And hey, give us a shout out where you're from. It's so awesome to have you guys from all over the world. We're going to have an awesome show today. But tell us where you're from. And also, you're going to be asking questions, I know. So make sure you throw those out while we're doing the show. Okay, well, let's get her started here. So I am Mark Silver. I'm an author and photographer in Carmel, California. And I want to let you know that today's show is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo Lab. I love these guys. They are just the best in terms of giving you exactly what you want, customer service. You can get prints. You can get books. You can really pretty much get photographs in any form. And that's the key to photography is you got to get it off your computer and out into the world. They'll help you do that. And remember, they're going to give you a 25% discount for new orders. So make sure you guys check them out. Okay. Now, listen, our guest today is none other than the famous Bambi Cantrell. She is world renowned as a wedding and portrait photographer. She's a master at capturing the human spirit. We're going to talk to her about that. She's published three best-selling books and has earned countless awards and accolades because she has such outstanding work. She also is really generous. She teaches, and she is a lot of fun. So, Bambi, welcome to Advancing Your Photography. Good to have you back with us. Thank you. It's really good to be here. Okay, we're going to have some fun today, and I think, should we just dive into it? I mean, here's my first question, which is, what really oh. drives you when it comes to photography? What's what's that passion that you have for it? Um, it's photography. I've, I've known since I was five years old that I wanted to be a photographer. When I was a little girl, I was the middle child of three girls, and I was always in trouble. <clears throat> I was that kid that was just like my nickname was jelly fingers and jelly so fingers. i was always yeah i was always doing something i wasn't supposed to be doing but my parents found out at a very very early age that if they handed me a photo album that i could be content for hours Ooh. i love pictures of people absolutely yeah. love people and so um that's what gives me my passion is our are, are people and i i don't think there's anything more entertaining or interesting than people are I hear you. And we're going to talk about some of the specific ways that you approach your subjects. But what are some of the key things that you use every time you pick up a camera or even before you pick one up? Um, I'd have to say I am very much um, interested in keeping abreast of, of uh, changing technology, yeah. of changing times, and also changing taste in the in the minds of our subjects. Now, some people would say, they would roll their eyes and say, oh, that's that's ridiculous. I, you know, it's your style. You should, you know, stay true to yourself. But I really believe that photography is my profession. It's not my religion. And so, you know, to give you an example of what I'm talking about is when I started in photography, it was in 1981 and um, as a professional. And at the, that time, you know, they had all the drop-in filters and oh, then yeah. they had... Um, it was, you know, double exposure and stuff like that. And I remember thinking to myself, if I could just learn how to do a good double exposure, like the picture of the bride and groom in the wine glass, uh, I just knew that would be like the best thing ever. Wow, but if yeah. you think about yeah. it, is that popular today? And the answer would be no. Right. And so I've learned that photography is that, that under the constraints of, of, of the photographic arena, I have to keep an open mind. And so I've adapted my style and I, I still have an underlying theme that runs through all my pictures, but I'm not, I'm not hardcore about one particular, um, you, you know, stylizing of my imagery. And, and when I'm ready to give it up, I'm ready to give it up and, and continue to, to go forward with, you know, advancing my profession as a professional photographer. You know, I was one of the first women in America to test digital cameras. Wow. And um, it was so funny because the first digital camera that I ever saw was um, at Photokina in Germany. And I was invited by, I think it was phase one, to come and test a new technology, this new camera they had coming out. And I was really excited about it. 
And so I go to Photokina and they, I brought a model from America. So I had this beautiful girl with me and they bring us into this room and they have this big piece of black velvet on with something underneath it on a table. Uh -huh. And I go, okay, I'm so excited. And they whip the black velvet off and it's a laptop computer with a lens on the front. Oh, it was no. the stupidest thing you ever saw. It had a three second capture. Think about how long three seconds three is. Three seconds. Yes. Okay. But you know, I am so grateful for that experience because that's how important keeping an open mind is. I got to be on the ground floor yeah. of new technology. And I really believe that I'm where I'm at today because I kept an open mind and didn't just, you know, walk away from this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. It's kind of like, you know, I guess when our parents or grandparents were young and they first introduced um, color photography, it was like, ooh, the big deal. Yeah. And then, you know, it became the norm. And then Polaroids. Remember, my dad had a Polaroid, and that was such a big deal. He's going around snapping Polaroid images everywhere. That was the Instagram of the day. It was like yeah, it was it sure was photos. Well, we were talking before the show some of your inspiration. Let's have a look. Let me uh, let me pull that up and let's take a look at what you've got there on your screen. Okay. If you Hang move on a me gonna... out of the way, then we're okay, good. I've got you moved out of the way. And I'm going to bring and... you up. Uh, okay, hang on a second. Can I'm you see my you. screen? We can, and I can see you as well. We have you in the little picture while we're looking at Prada here. Okay. Now, the reason that I have this slide up, this is a, a photograph of a window, a display window that I took in San Francisco. And you want to talk about how I keep my edge, how I keep moving forward, is that I keep abreast of changing times. And... I like to see what I can learn by the way people display their wares. And I don't think that there is a time that is more vital than the one we are in currently. Yeah. Um, photographers are going to have to find a way to reinvent themselves if they are not going to starve to death. That is an absolute truth True um, because it is a very difficult time that we're in and photographers that are, I'm um, used to doing things the same old way and don't want to change. I think they're going to find themselves in a very difficult place. So I, I like to get a fresh approach, fresh ideas. And I like to find companies that spend billions and billions of dollars trying to attract the same client that I am. And I have found that Prada is one of them. Our client, our clients are women. There is no doubt about it. The mm. photographer that, or the, the person who buys photography by and large are women. And so because of that, I want to find out how other companies that sell products, because photography is a product. Yes, it's an art, but at the end of the day, it is a product. And so I want to find out how companies differentiate themselves one from another. So here's a picture that I pulled from a store window in, uh, uh, in San Francisco for Prada. Well, what are they selling? Well, what is that? Oh, this see. is what they're selling. And oh, okay. you know, obviously, they're, they're selling shoes. But what I like to show is the unique way that they have found to display this particular product. They've taken something that's just, you know, something that you wear on your feet and they've created a piece of artwork around it. So how might we translate that to the realm of photography? Well, one of the ways that I like to translate that is maybe it's in the way that we display our product, um, our imagery. Like for instance, in my studio, one of the things that I do is when I capture an image, I always print. I am a yeah. I am absolutely determined that my clients are going to get the printed image. Um, what does this image tell me? Well, what if we printed on maybe one of a photo's beautiful metal pieces? Yeah. Not every photograph looks great on a metal piece. I'll show you some images later in my show that are gonna go screaming crazy on metal. So I, I believe that images like this help us to kind of differentiate ourselves and give us a, a our mind to something clever and something more interesting because we all pay about the same amount to have a photograph printed. So if that's the case, then we have to find a way to make our images look special in, in capture and also in the way that we present them um, so that the client sees them as something very special and worth maybe a little bit more than what somebody else is charging. Because, you know, I mean, let's face it, there's thousands of people doing the digital files these days. So 
Here's another image. I love, love, love this storefront window. This is again from San Francisco. Yeah. And this is for Louis Vuitton. And one of the things that I really found incredibly clever is if you look at the picture, well, what are they selling? It's hard to see because the, the it's a handbag, actual product. Right? Huh? Handbag, yeah, there's some right? these are handbags. And I'll pull my cursor up. There's a handbag yeah. here and then there's one here. But how much real estate do those handbags hold? Very little. Not very much. The majority of this image is a really funky little art piece. But do you see how they've taken that product and they've elevated it and made it look cute and interesting so that somebody goes, they go, oh, wow, what an incredible window. Oh, you know, that's a really beautiful handbag. I really like that. I think I want to go. I, I'd like to go in there and see that. Right. And how many times have, for instance, with husbands, um, it, it's hilarious because if you ask like a, like my 45th wedding anniversary is next week. Ooh, yes, 45 years. My husband and I got married as babies. Um, I guess. You know, I, I have found that with my husband that if I give him choices <laughs> of things that I like, because he doesn't really, you know, he's not, he doesn't really know like sometimes what a woman likes. So when it, in, in the case of like what I have in front of me, Louis Vuitton, I'm thinking a special event. A husband says, or his wife goes, well, honey, what would you like for your anniversary? Or what would you like for your birthday? Or whatever the case is. And she says, well, I really want, I'd really like for something special this year. I'd really like a, a really nice Louis Vuitton handbag. Now, they're not cheap. They're very expensive. Yeah. But the point is, is that for special occasions, there are special products. Right. And I like to take that concept and move it into the world of photography. How about a wedding? Is there another event that's more special than a wedding? Yeah. And so with that in mind, I, I, when people come to, to interview for a wedding photographer, I want them to see my company as the Louis Vuitton of the photo community. Are you starting to see how they kind of work together? Yeah. Can we see an example of, I mean, I'm sure you're going there anyway, but I'd love to see how this translates to you. Okay. Well, hang on. We're going to get okay. there. All right. I'm just... <laughs> I'm so now I run. want to show you how it translates uh, from the world of shoes into fashion. Right. And there's a twofold reason why I'm pulling up these the next couple of slides. This is the Christian Dior. It was the Christian Dior, Dior exhibit um, that I went to in Paris. Now, this is an incredibly powerful exhibit. I literally had goosebumps the entire time I was there. I believe that fashion rules the world. Because fashion dictates so many things about what people like. To give you an example, fashion dictates whether we like dresses and whether we like a style of photography that's real uh, flashy, maybe uh, um, the double exposures, maybe lots of overlays, lots of um, you know visual effects, or whether we are liking things that are more minimal. To give you an example, in the... Um, um, early days when I started in photography, um, I've been collecting brides magazines since like the, the early 80s. And I noticed a huge change in 1990 and around the ni early 90s, 1991. In the brides magazines, uh, up until around that time, 1991, all the dresses had lots of stuff on them. They had dingleberries and <laughs> lace and beads all over. And they had the little pointed headpiece with the little pearl yeah. on the end that never was right here. It was always like right there. And... And then in the early 90s, it was over. All of a sudden, the big word was minimalism. You know, oh, I, I want a natural style of photography. I want all photojournalism. And photojournalism, that more natural style became the rage. And that's why slides like this are really important because they really help us to see trends and where things have come from and where they're going to. Yeah. And then the pendulum also always swings back the other way. And so if you look at this, this is also from that Christian Dior exhibit. You see a variety of different types of textures, um, a, a lots of varying um, degrees of fluffiness in the dresses, poofy sleeves. And then you mm -hmm. see some things that are more streamlined. And those tell us a lot about where the, the market is going to. Um, and this is from that exact same exhibit. But what I'd like you to see in this is look at how the, the trend has changed. In this particular Christian Dior exhibit, they showed like Christian Dior from the early days through the modern century. Okay. And the other thing I also like about this is I like the fact, notice the three, one, two, three. Yeah. Um, 
Um, the, the composition, that's one of the other things that you learn just from uh, looking at a, an exhibit. In addition to that, um, I love this particular slide is from that same one. Notice how the style has changed from this to from this and this. So see how clean and streamlined yeah. this was? This, I want to say, was around the 40s. Okay. And then this is very over the top. This is from the 80s, and it's so appropriate. I mean, they had dingleberries and all kinds of beads on what everything. You were mentioning, yeah. So these kinds of slides really, really help me. This is from, I believe, the 70s. Perfect, beautiful, beautiful thing. And by the way, I really believe that the 70s are coming back now. That kind of styling is coming back. Really? And so all of these different kinds of images really help me to see where the market is going. Now, this is another image that I pulled from that Christian Dior exhibit. And um, this was, they had someone in that Christian Dior exhibit that was actually hand making one of their handbags. Now, how does that translate to photography? Well, what it did is it showed this, the organic nature and the specialness of these particular handbags, how that each one is handmade by somebody standing in this little room, hand gluing them down, which validates the price that they pay for uh -huh. that particular product. And so I thought oh, that that is so clever. How could I use that in, in what I'm doing? Maybe it means that um, my mats are hand cut. I use eight ply mats for my images and all of my um, my images, even if it's a four by six, comes in uh, an eight ply mat that is um, a, a, a ten a eight by ten size. So even if they get a really small print, it's going to be displayed in a beautiful acid free mat. So yeah. it validates the price that they're paying for something. Very smart. What does this slide teach us? Do you notice how they have taken garments and they have they have they have linked them to fine art? Well, that's what my goal is: is to link. Um, link what I'm doing to fine art. Now, my style is pretty simple. I'm not one that does a lot of, you know, um, you know, period pieces or anything like that. Yeah. But this is more of where I would go with that. Okay. So, but now you might ask yourself, well, well um, you know, what is this all about? Um, actually, I shot this in a, in a hotel room um, when I was in Paris. So notice that the background is just simple. Just a yeah. clean, simple background. And let's talk for a moment about what she's wearing. This is nothing more than a piece of fabric that I bought in New York City for $10. And I, you can't tell, but on the backside, I just stapled it together to form a skirt. I would it's never know It's really that. close to the body, all the way down. She's actually standing on my camera case. And um, it's covered. And then I bought these feathers in San Francisco at um, at um, one of the um, fashion, the fabric stores in the city. And all I've done is just stapled it um, to a piece of ribbon that I tied around her waist. Unbelievable. It only has to look good on camera. Yeah. So why do this? Why do this kind of thing? Well, I like to do these kinds of um, imagery. It's because of the experience. The experience is as important as the click of the shutter. Mm. You see, if the client loves the experience and they go, oh my goodness, well, my photographer created something really different. Um, you will not believe she took some feathers and she just stapled a, a piece of ribbon to them and tied them around my waist. And this is what we got. You see, those kinds yeah. of experiences, this translates right back to what you saw in the very first slide from Prada. Right. You see, they've taken an atom, an inanimate object, and they've given it a life, and made it about the experience. That is so smart, Bambi, because it is about that. I mean, when you're selling your work, it's a, it's the whole package. It's mm -hmm. how they feel when they're being photographed by you, and how they come away from that, because that's mm -hmm. that's really what they remember. I mean, they see the photograph, but they remember that experience with you and how they felt at the time, right? That's really right. important. And what I really like about it is I love having clients 
come back and go, oh my goodness, Bambi, I can't believe you did that. And they will refer friends to me based upon that experience. So it, it really goes a long way to creating a unique brand that transcends time, that gives you longevity. Um, I've been in the photo industry now for over 30 years, and it really is so important more than ever to keep myself um, fresh with new ideas. So I, I continue every day. I'm on. Um, I'm looking for images that that um, that kind of spark my interest, and that yeah. I can learn. I don't copy them, but I use them as reference points. Like right now, I have a photo shoot coming up in two weeks for Metropolitan Bride magazine. So I'm in the middle of creating a mood board for that. And so I go to Pinterest. I love Pinterest because you can type in a variety of, uh, of scenarios or, or things, um, and then it'll give you a picture ideas. And so I pull them into a folder that I will share with my uh, makeup artist and my hairdresser so we can start pulling together ideas for creating a unique experience. Fantastic. Let's see some more. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I pulled this image in here for a reason. And the reason is, is that especially when you're doing editorial photography, um, it's, there are some times that the, the mood and the, um, the visual impact is not about things being sharp or crisp. It's about having that bit of, of mystery, and that's one of the elements. Photography, in my opinion, is about emotion, one way or the other. Either yep. love it or hate it, but don't be ambiguous about it because if you are, then it's awful and nobody's going to ever want it. Yep. And so taking it from there, here is the actual, here's what it actually looked in real life with this young lady. And by the way, this could be a high school senior. Um, this is just nothing more than newspaper wrapped around her body. Wow. Um, and then I added little pieces of tool that were, that would, uh, come in and out of it. Um, the tattoos that are on her arm, mother would be thrilled because they're all wash off. Nice. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's super easy. And all we did to create this look was just to use eyeliner and use a template, a, a, um, a template for, um, being able to, to draw it on the body so that it looked, it looked nice. Let's is, talk all a minute the, about- is all the light coming just from the windows or do you have an, any other light going on here? Um, actually, it's a good question, Mark. Yeah. Um, I have um, right up here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's a yeah. large soft box oh, um, yeah. outside of this window. I yeah. use Profoto Studio Lighting. Um, and this is taken with the B1 kit and I, I love the Profoto Lighting. Um, it was worth every penny I've ever spent. I have the D1 kit. Uh, which has four heads, and then I have the B1 kit or the B1 or B10 kit um, that is portable, and I use both of them all the time. And I, I here's what I love about it: it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. It's it's not the least expensive, but I really believe if you buy the best, then you, there's no apologies. It lasts for a lifetime, yeah. and my stuff lasts for a very long time. And I'm not one of those photographers who, you know, <clears throat> has to have the latest and greatest thing. I like something that I, I want to spend a significant amount of money on something that is going to last. Um, and that's why I use Nikon equipment. I use, um, the Nikon Z seven yep. and, um, a variety of different lenses. I also have the Nikon, uh, D eight fifty, which I, I have to tell you is, really a tight close. I love that camera. Um, it's just an amazing piece of equipment and I use a variety of different lenses, everything from the 105, 14 to the, uh, 70 to 200, 28, um, uh, for my, for my work. So, um, and one of the reasons that I like the Nikon equipment is that all the lenses are interchangeable. Now with the Z7, there's an adapter that you can get to, to fit all older lenses. But right. if you buy the, one of the D bodies, the, the Nikon D, um, like the D850, all of the older lenses will work on that. And I find that so nice That's because really not all can, not all camera manufacturers, you know, some of them, um, you have to buy a new lens or a new uh, to go to fit because their, their lenses don't all fit. And I find that yeah. annoying. So can we go back uh, to the, the, first version of the, that you showed I just want to see this okay now you know the thing about focus uh, Henry Cartier-Bresson said this he said 
sharpness and focus is bourgeois. You know, he, he considered it like, okay, it's a middle class thing. Everybody sort of puts this standard on it. But when you're talking about art, it isn't important. I mean, what's important is, as you said, the emotion that you're trying to convey. That's exactly right. And you know, it's funny because the older I get, the more I really appreciate that there are times for selective focus and selective unfocus. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that sounds kind of weird, but, um, yeah, I and know. I prefer to do uh, everything in camera. Like this is the way it is in camera. Um, I could go into Photoshop and, and um, take the focus away from any image that I want to, but I really like, you know, doing it the old school way of in camera, you know, yeah. get, doing it the way you meant it to look in camera. Um, I've always been that way. Um, and I think it's because I came from the time when we worked with film, yeah. you know, film cameras and, and, you know, a roll of 12 exposures or whatever. And, you know, what you saw is what you got. And so I, I feel in many ways um, I have deep respect for the photographers of, that learn that genre because you had to do it all. Nowadays, you can send it to a digital artist and basically, you know, you can take a, a mediocre image and if you have a good digital artist, they can make it look like a Picasso or whatever, you know? Yeah. So this has a film look. It almost looks like a Kodachrome to me, you know? It's mm -hmm. just... Yeah. And what was it? So was it just a really slow exposure? Do you remember what your settings were? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no okay, that's fine. But it fine. was a slow exposure. It was definitely a slow exposure. Probably 30th of a second or something. Yeah. And because there's a little edge, it's like the edges have a little bit of sharpness to them. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so it was a slow exposure, but there was a window um, up above, um, we're up above her head. And that was the only light source in this particular room. So, right. Awesome. This is fantastic, Bambi. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Yeah. So, okay. So now let's talk about, you know, we, we, um, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, ways to set yourself apart. And one of the things that I try to do is, um, I give myself a personal assignment at least a couple of times a year, you know, at least two or three, sometimes four times a year where I, I have a, a play date set up. And in that play date, I um, create a theme along with a hairdresser, a makeup artist, just a day for us to get together and just have some fun. And I really love doing that because it affords me an opportunity to try um, some different things. It affords me an opportunity to play without having to worry about pleasing anybody. I'm just having fun. That's yeah. really what it's all about. And if I don't get anything I'm thrilled about, eh, it's a day, big deal. It's not going to kill me. Yeah. But I, in fact, I find that I learn as much from the things I did wrong as the things that I did right. So it really, either way, it inspires me to, um, to move forward a bit. So on this particular play date, um, um, we were working with putting some sort of floral pieces together in the heads of these girls. And I really liked, this was one of my favorite little head pieces that we did. It was just really fun. Let's see. Oops. I can't make it bigger. Um, um, I loved the just the real the the texture that was that was on this piece. Yeah. And in, in this particular case, I would like to fo talk about a little bit about the communication that goes into the posing of this particular subject. You'll notice in this photograph that she's got her shoulder up, yeah. bringing that shoulder up to the to the um, to the face and dropping the chin creates an emotional response. It creates a bit of an attitude, which I think is super important um, in creating images that are going to ha that are going to look unique or look interesting. Look, looking interesting is so much more important to me than perfection. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I always say expression over perfection. Because um, if a photograph is interesting from an expression standpoint, then you'll want to look at it. Um, if it's if there's nothing to it, then it's like meh, you know, yeah. and and. It can be the best, it can be the technically best picture, <coughs> you know, but that won't mean it has any, there's nothing to it. We had Scott Kelby on last week or a week before, and he was talking about how, how much photographers tend to obsess over things that nobody else is going to care about. Like, right, oh, there's true. a little bit of noise there. Nobody else is looking at that but you. They're looking at the expression. And that, this is the thing to underscore. It's like, that's what they're going to resonate with. 
is not that yeah, you had a, no noise in the back, you know, one little portion of your image. So um, moving forward just a little bit, um, I want you to notice her expression. It, it, and when it comes to expression, expression is important in the context of what the image is all about. Yeah. So in the context of this, she has this regal look. The, the clothing and, and her accessories are very regal. It's important that the, um, the, the face exude that same type of look. Like this would look so dumb if she had a smile on her face. It, would be, right. it wouldn't match, it doesn't, it doesn't compute. It's like, what? It doesn't feel good. So I try to have, um, to create images that have, um, um, where the, the, everything about the image is in harmony. In other words, the face is in harmony with the clothing and the clothing is in harmony with the background or, or it's in the same key and such. Yeah. So um, this is also a gown that I created. It's basically that same dress that you saw earlier, except I added a large piece of fabric to the bottom to give it this really large um, 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 mermaid style look. Oh, yeah. You know, so it only has to look good from the camera. So it's, it's actually really dumb easy. And the, what I always tell people to do is if you want to practice something like this, it's really quite easy. Um, if you're a, a guy, I would have a girl help you with it have somebody who um, can help you manipulate the fabric on the body of your female subject so that it doesn't make your subject feel uncomfortable. Right. Um, and if, if she's that kind of girl who might go, you know, no, I wouldn't want a guy touching me or something. Um, but if you can, and, and the biggest thing is keep the fabric and things close to the body. It's going to really make um, any subject look better. You know, Bambi, what I love about what you're going over is these things are completely accessible to anyone. So you, you've shot storefront windows. We can all go do that. You're using fabric that's inexpensive. Models, we can, we can invite a friend or you know, somebody who, who wants to model for free, and it costs nothing. So that's this true. Is, anybody watching this can do the same thing. And you know, especially, like this is another piece of fabric that's on this, this young lady. It's three yards of fabric this is by the way my favorite piece of fabric i have i love it i've had it for two years now and it's the kind it's stretchy you want stretchy material because stretchy fabric will work on a variety of different body types so if you have a bigger girl or a pregnant woman um it works beautiful on that body type as well as even those little skinny girls as well so uh it's it's uh, very forgiving the other thing i like this particular fabric is the kind of um um, fabric that they use for uh, dance costumes. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's actually quite sheer. So I bought four yards of it and I wrapped it around the body twice to kind of, um, you know, to, to give us a little bit of coverage to the yeah. subject. Um, and what I'd like you to notice is up here, what's holding this on the model is one piece of wire. Huh. I use a very simple little piece of wire about that long, about uh -huh. a foot long maybe. And basically you just thread it through one side of the fabric in the middle, and then you drape it around the neck and then you you, you um, attach it to the other piece of fabric on the other side. It's super easy. And when you're done, you just cut the wire and take it out and it doesn't mess up your fabric. It doesn't That's tear amazing. it up. It's really fun. And then I bought a couple of decorative pins that I can use. Um, I build it on each subject differently. I never make the same dress twice. First of all, I can't remember how I did it. Um, <laughs> so I couldn't do it the same if I wanted to. Yeah. But I also like it because it takes all the pressure off of your subject to, to, um, to bring in tons and tons and tons of pieces. You can say, hey, just show up, bring a pair of nude underwear, um, and we're good to go. So, and, and then if they don't have that, then I just say, hey, go to commando and we're all going to be fine, you know, so <laughs> we'll just cover it. Um, now let's talk a bit about posing because posing is really, really, I think one of the areas where when I look at the photo industry, so many um, photographers lack those skills. You'll notice in this picture of this young lady, this knee is bent and that yeah. knee is draped over a little bit onto the other leg. Now that's a really critical element because what happens when you bend this knee is you put tension in this part ah. of the hip, 
which is very flattering, which gives this girl a little bit more shape, gives her more of a waistline. Because when you push the hip out this way, it creates a bit more of an indent here in the waistline and gives her a bit more uh, of a an, a, an, um, an, um, an hourglass figure. Right. Um, the next thing is you want to try to make sure you keep those shoulders pushed down. Sometimes girls have a tendency to pull their shoulders up, which makes their neck look very short. Mm. So you want to keep those arms down if you possibly can. And then you want to show the side of the hand, not the back of the hand. If you look at the back of my hand, it's almost the same size as my face. Right. So turning the hand sideways gives it a much more graceful look, and it, it's a nice way to finish off. Um, an image. Um, let's go from there and we're going to talk a little bit about how to light in relation to that. Um, this is in my studio in, in Benicia. This is one of the images I did for Metropolitan Bride um, for the um, spring summer last year. Again, that same little concept that I showed you about bending the knee. Yep. In this case, I had her bend this particular knee. See how we get that little light trap yeah. right there? It's uh -huh. really important that we have that little highlight right there because it separates the waistline and the shadow area here from the arm, which gives a semblance of shape to the body. Um, you'll notice that I turn my models, my subjects, about um, between 45 and 90 degrees of the light source. This is just window light portrait. It's just a window light portrait. Um, I have over here just off camera, is a large um, reflector. I use sun bounce reflectors, and I have one that's like a five foot reflector, and I just absolutely love it. It's either five or six feet. I think it's five feet. Um, again, the arms are kept a little bit away from the body, hand turned out, and then face turned back towards the light source. Um, I really want this little bit of a highlight on that cheek, and it's a really nice way to give your, your subject shape. And then quite often, I will have the subject just slightly lean towards the camera mm -hmm. with the, with whatever body part I want. Sometimes it's with the chest. I found that if you tell the subject with their chest to lean forward slightly, it kind of straightens out the back. The modeling on her arms is amazing. I mean, that's just from the reflector and the window. Yes. Now, I remember you talked before, I don't know if you still use these, but about going to Home Depot and just getting one of those insulated uh, silver pieces and using that as a reflector. Do you still use I have, those? Yes, I do. I have um, about 10 of them in my studio. Uh, they're quite large. We had them measured, uh, made to measure the, to fit those windows right here. So as you can see, the okay. window that's in this picture, um, we can block all the light out in our studio if we want to. So that if we want to use studio lighting or we want to change the direction of light, um, then we can we can um, create basically um, gobos that go in the windows to block out the light. Um, and then if we want to use them as a reflector on the side, we can because they're quite large. These are I want to say about eight feet tall. Right. And they're yeah. they're made of like they're they're thicker than foam core. They're probably about this thick, so maybe an inch and a half thick. Um, so, uh, we don't have air conditioning in our building. It's a very old building built in the 1800s. So sometimes on those hot summer days, it gets a little bit really hot. And yeah. so putting those in the window is a great way to keep it cool in the studio. Now, are the, is that just wind blowing or do you have a fan doing that? Is that just coming in from the Bay Breeze? Um, we do have a fan. We have a very large fan. Um, it's probably, um, I'd say... Can you okay. see my hand? It's yeah, quite big. Um, and it's very, very powerful. So we can, quite honestly, I can't remember. It's I, we probably a combination. Yeah, because yeah, you're right by the bay, see, so you've obviously got yeah. a lot of breeze. So the wind, I mean, th this window is open. Yeah. Um, and it has to be up a little higher because I don't, I, I want a little bit of wind under here, under this dress, to show the detail on this gown, but not, not too much. That's fabulous. I love the flowing lines. It accentuates her. You know, it's perfect. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you like it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, from, from a lot of my photography, um, I, I do believe in using studio lighting, but I also sometimes find that, that if you are, if you really understand direction of light and you, and you um, become comfortable using it, it means that you can photograph very quickly in any kind of situation 
without a lot of fuss. And especially I, I have found that that learning that concept has been very helpful to me when I had, um, when I'm on location for, at a wedding or something, because in those kinds of environments, you got to learn to get it right without too much time because everybody wants beautiful pictures, but not everybody wants to spend a lot of time taking those beautiful pictures. Yeah. Sometimes they want it, they want it beautiful, but they want it done like in five seconds. So you have to, you have to learn how to um, be able to uh, place your subject or where do your camera position needs to be in relation to that subject. So can you show um, us with your hands as you did before, how you see the light in the room, how you use your hand? To oh, see well, what, yeah, I can show yeah. that to you. Yeah. So like um, this room might be a little bit difficult. I have a window in front of my, um, my screen. Yeah. So that's going to give me our main light, I believe, unless it's coming from behind me. Um, but you'll notice that over on this side, there's a bit of a shadow area. It should be right here yeah. on this side. So uh, depending on, for instance, if I wanted to, um, um, depending on the angle that my camera position is, that's really the whole key. It's where's camera position in relation to the light source. So for instance, if I photograph from this side over here in the same, coming from the same direction as the light source, that's broad light. And that's gonna make my face look larger. Um, that's really good for somebody who has a long, narrow face, not mine necessarily. However, if I change my position and move camera position over here and photograph on the shadow side of the face, then that's going to compress and make my face look a bit more narrow. This is also a great technique for being able to show off texture. Um, um, for instance, if you look at the photograph of this young lady, when I walked in this room, I knew that I, I um, this was a really a cool environment, but I didn't want the environment to overtake the subject. Right. So I, I found by placing my camera position about at least 90 degrees from the way the light was coming in the room that I could really show off some of the details and the, um, the texture in this incredible gown this young lady had on and um, also separate her face and her hair from that background. That's really important. Yeah. She had really dark hair. So um, allowing that highlight for coming in from that window to really um, separate her face and her hair from the background gives her a bit more depth and dimensionality. Fantastic. So depth and dimensionality doesn't just work for pretty girls. Sometimes it's, I mean, for photographing anyone, if that's what it's all about is we want depth and dimensionality. Whether you're using studio strobes or whether you're using window light, you want to learn to uh, identify um, where you want to place your light source or where you want to place your subject in relation to that light source. So for instance, with this little boy, um, there is a big window over on the, right in front of him and okay. it's higher up. I would say it's about three feet from the floor. So it's giving me a nice angle of main light on this little boy. Right. But then I had to place him, I placed him here in this particular spot because there was an open door at the end of this corridor, which would give me a nice bit of separation oh, yeah. between him and the background. You can see if I placed him somewhere over here, then I'm not going to get that separation and it's going to go from highlights to black. And I want dimensionality. So my assistant is standing right off camera, engaging with this little boy. This, uh, by the way, just for those of you that photograph little kids, this is one of those little pigs that has a ball in its nose. Uh -huh. And when you push it, the ball pops out. I'm telling you, I would love to market that product. I that's think that's the cool. invention since a wheel. It is so phenomenal with little kids. They just love it. And he absolutely would do anything we wanted as long as we'd let him have that to play with. So I have a question now. So when you're doing, okay, you have an idea of obviously what you have a vision in mind here, but is it, just sort of trial and error as you move around with your camera angle, or do you have it pretty well figured out before you even, uh, you know, get into setting up tripods and whatnot? Well, I would probably say yes and no. Yeah. I have a rough idea of what I want to accomplish, but I don't like to put blinders on my eyes and, and make it a rigid experience, a formula experience. Yeah. Yeah. I want it to be loose and that I can go with the flow. So to give you an example of what I'm talking about, let's say I'm photographing a little child like this 
And in my head, in my perfect Bambi universe, we're going to go from this set to this set. And this child's going to do everything that I want them to do. And they're going to behave and sit still. And perfect, it's all right? going to come together just perfectly, right? It always works Well, that way. never happens. Yeah. So it's been my experience that as long as the subject is having a good time, they'll love their pictures. But if you make the experience so excruciatingly difficult and you get amazing pictures, but the subject hated the experience, Yikes. Then it is awful and they'll never have you back. Yeah. Um, I know firsthand about that because I had a wedding one time where I um, tried to put into practice many different concepts that I had learned in a workshop. And so I had all these great ideas and I literally worked opposed to a, with a bride on her wedding day, mind you, for probably 25 minutes, a pose, a single pose to get it perfect. Well, I found out that this was such an unpleasant experience. The photograph was amazing, but the client hated the experience so much that they hated it. They, uh. they would not refer me. And so that's really the bottom line is you have to think about when it comes to clients, what is in the best interest of the client? Do they know what perfection looks like? Do they care about all those accolades? And I'm going to tell you, in my 30 years of experience, I've never had a single client hire me because I'm a master photographer. Right. They've never hired me because I'm a triple master. They never even ask that question. They either love what you do, they like your personality, and they think that you could be a good fit, or they don't. And so... I, I'm not, um, I, I participate in competitions. Um, I, I enjoy it for myself, but I don't shoot client work for competition because it's been my experience. I have to be in the moment for that particular subject and I want to create images that, that they go, wow, you caught my spirit. That's so awesome. You know, what I love about everything you're going over again is it's totally accessible to any photographer. There's no special equipment. It's just you, your camera and your vision and your ability to, to interact with other people, which is really the key thing here. Yeah. And I believe that that's why if I'm successful, it is absolutely 10% photographic ability and 90% the ability to, um, to become one with a client. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can't even tell you how it, that's actually my motivation. It, it motivates me so many times, especially, um, I'll get, um, I do a lot of corporate work for very wealthy executives and it always cracks me up because in the beginning they they put on this face, you know, they're trying to look Joe cool and everything. Yeah. And, and then, so I just start asking the questions about the stupid, random things that come out of my mouth. I don't even know what I'm saying. Cause it just comes Bambi-isms. out. Yeah, total bambiisms for sure. And and I, I call it um, bambler because I'm just bambler. You know, or blurbing out things. So anyway, it's um, I can't tell you how many times when I've started a session and then about mm, five or six frames in, I figured out who they are. And I went, ah, oh. I, I, I shot, I'll tell you an experience I had once. I photographed Gary Payton's wedding, the basketball player. He was with the Seahawks and then also with LA Lakers. Mm -hmm. And, um, when, um, they hired me to shoot their wedding, um, I went to their home, um, in, in the Oakland Hills and to do their engagement session. And I'll never forget it because it set the tone for everything. So Gary comes uh, into the living, he throws himself down on a chair, like, let's get this over with. I mean, he looked at me, some little chick and he's like, Oh brother, what are you going to do? And so I just looked at him and went, well, you know what? I'd really like to just watch you all interact a bit. So I had scoped out the house ahead of time and we went down into their basement where they had this pool table and he had this fabulous sign that said Peyton Place on it. So I just said, you know, I'd really like to watch you and Monique play pool for a little while. Would that be okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they started playing pool and, and then um, we did that for a little while and I shot some images. And then I said, you know, Gary, I really want to watch you shoot some hoops you know and his wife monique um had been a basketball player herself and so i thought well this is kind of be fun so we go outside and he they're shooting hoops and playing and they just forgot the camera was there 
So after we did that for a little while, he comes up to me. I'll never forget this as long as I live. It was such a phenomenal experience. He says, hey, bam. He goes, do you want me to go put my swim trunks on so you can get some pictures of us in the pool? Drop the mic. Boom. That's when I knew I had him. You got it. And I, I'm telling you to this day, that was the crowning moment in my career because I found out who the real guy was inside and not the guy who the basketball player wearing a white cape on their wedding day, you know, thinking they're Joe cool with five Rolls Royces or whatever. I love it. So it was well, uh, very cool. It's getting it's capturing that real spirit, which is what you're known for. Listen, it's hard to believe, but we've We've been on almost an hour. I could keep you here all day, but um, maybe we ought to just take a look at if there are any final point of advice you'd like to leave these guys with to up their own photography, to advance as photographers. Yeah, I'm going to show you just like one last image. Yeah, I love um, this one. Um, oh, this wow. is what I'm doing these days. There's I'm, your double exposure. Huh? It is. It's pretty much a double exposure, a modern day double exposure. And... I'm, you know, I'm just trying different things. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think that we all have to keep it fresh and we can't say that, um, um, you know, this is, you know, this is perfect from an art standpoint, but you know, if it makes you happy, it's great. Yeah. And so I always try to just try some things that people are either going to love or they're going to hate. And it's okay if they hate it, as yeah. long as they don't feel, you know, eh, mech, mech about it. So it's like, you know, it, that's kind of where I'm at today. That's awesome. So you're experimenting and yes, because these images are very different than what I looked at, what we looked at back in the day, many years ago. So, <laughs> and I, I love how you're getting your inspiration just like the rest of us can get. So any yeah. final piece of advice you'd like to leave us with? Um, I would say that the best advice I ever got, I got from Dennis Reggie. And that was to not price my services according to my own personal budget. And so I would say that for photographers out there that are struggling, um, I would say don't be in a huge hurry to discount your pricing. Mm -hmm. I would say find mm -hmm. other ways to give your work value um, other than like giving a, a discount because at the end of the day, you gotta feed your family. And if you can't do that, then you're gonna have to you know, do something else. And I would highly recommend um, you know, finding something to make your work look special, um, get involved in your community, um, keep a positive attitude and really let the human experience rule. And this to me is an area where I think younger photographers can really learn from the older ones. And that is personal touch, keeping in touch with your, your clients, you know, writing them letters, like a real letter that you have to write. Yeah. That you put um, in the mail. Yeah, that you actually put in the mail would be a great thing. I've, I've created a line of greeting cards um, that I've been sending out, you know, cards to people, just giving them a little bit of encouragement, saying, hey, I, I just want you to know, hang in there, um, you know, and, and giving them something positive because, let's face it, there's enough negativity out there for a lifetime. Yeah. Bambi, wow. As I said, we could stay out here for a couple more hours. And thank you for your generosity. These are awesome tips. These are things that again, any of us can use and should. Well, I, I, I'm glad I could help and I hope you have a great day. You too. And congratulations on your anniversary coming up. When is that next Thank week? You. Yep. Awesome. Well, well done. Fantastic. Thank you. Wow, you guys. So that's a whole lot of stuff that you can put right to use. And I want to see you do that because those tips, I, this is what I kept resonating with her, is just how easy, I'm not going to say easy, but they're, they're within your grasp. Now, obviously, you have to work with them, make them your own. you got to do the hard work. you got to roll up your sleeves. But when you do that, you're going to expand your photography no matter what your genre is. And that is my goal with advancing your photography. Because you can listen to these points, even if you're a landscape photographer, and translate them to your work, or you're a sports photographer. And you know, it's, it's, you, you're going to learn these things and put them to use. Definitely get out there and try these things out, okay? So listen, um, make sure you guys, if you're not already a part of the AYP club, make sure you are. 
because we can carry on the conversations there and you know put your comments and questions there as well this video will be coming back and it's going to be uh up i i guess right away right jared is this just stay up with this link and um tomorrow we have bob holmes and andrea back with us i don't know that we even have chosen a topic yet but you're going to get two pro photographers talking about their work and their continuing saga of getting out there into the world and how it is out there and what's going on and their challenges and how they meet those challenges. And listen, make sure you do follow me on um, Instagram so you can stay up to date because we do put notices there of the upcoming videos and so on. Tell your friends share the video and subscribe. If you haven't already done that, please do subscribe so you don't miss any of our new episodes. And last but not least, and you can say this with me, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Love you guys. Stay well, stay safe, but get out whenever you can. Okay. Take care.